Um, oh, yes. Okay, so it's nice to see you guys. Um, Leonard and I are going to give a combined talk. Um, and so I'm going to start off with just talking about some neuron models um, and how to measure synchrony. So this is, so I'm going to look at some neuron models from the crazy complicated to the stupid simple. That's my tagline. So, oh yeah, right. So I think like everything, like all the talks today, this really started out with a neuroscience problem. So there were a few of us, um, and we had this, you know, this interesting problem. We sort of thought it might be cool to look at uh, electric fields and how does that play around with synchrony in a population of neurons. Um, and that's really, I'm not going to talk about the neuroscience. That's the last thing I'm going to say about the neuroscience. But I just want you to, to take away that we're sort of looking at synchrony in a population, kind of how do electric fields play around with that. So, and of course the neuroscience problem kind of leads immediately to this, you know, this meta problem, which is, so how do I investigate this question? So how do, what approach am I going to use to attack this? And so I just said that, you know, that we're like all the other talks today, but I think where we're a little different is that when we wanted to ask this question, we really didn't have any data. So we were pre-data, um, you know, and all the other talks are really about data analysis, stats techniques, how do you uh, manipulate the data to answer a question, but we didn't have any data. So this isn't, the first part of this talk at least isn't going to be about data analysis, but it's going to be about uh, modeling. So it was unclear how to experiment. Um, and if we did come up with an experiment, it would probably mean new instruments, uh, new skills. You know, we didn't know how to do this kind of electrophysiology. So it would probably mean new friends, people to bum the equipment off of and hang out in their lab. Uh, so that's probably not the best way to approach it. So we thought it probably makes sense, the logical thing to try is a model. Um, and so this is, I'll just sort of go through a few of the neuron models that we used uh, to approach this problem. And probably the classic mathematical model of a neuron is the Hodgkin-Huxley. And for how simple it is, it's really an amazingly accurate description of how neurons initiate action potentials and how action potentials propagate throughout neurons. And so really it's a model of the cell membrane. So this little patch of membrane, you know, there's this stereotypical action potential, which is the membrane voltage. How do the properties of the membrane lead it to generate this, this, this really stereotypical spike? Oh, yeah, right. Okay, so yeah, Fred asked us, wanted us to do a few things, a presentation. This is an email from Fred. I hope he's okay with me putting it up on the screen. Uh, but he wanted to, you know, he wanted the presentations to talk about the type of analysis we're presenting, uh, where it's appropriate, how do you do it, um, and how do you interpret the results. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, sort of what, what is the Hodgkin-Huxley and um, where it's appropriate. So this is really... This circuit diagram is really a, um, sort of a, a breakdown of what the Hodgkin-Huxley model is and what it assumes. So this is uh, a model of the cell membrane. So we have outside the cell on the top. Uh, the inside of the cell is on the bottom. And they've decomposed the membrane into a few components. So on the left, there's a capacitor. So there's a capacitive component to the membrane. Um, there's some resistors that are modeling the ion channels. Um, so the GN there is sodium and potassium channels and a leak channel. Um, and so these are the equations for the Hodgkin-Huxley model. Um, I really, I'm, you know, we could do a whole class on the Hodgkin-Huxley model. I'm not really an expert on it, so this is the only slide I'm going to have with Hodgkin-Huxley equations. Uh, but it's a four-dimensional ordinary differential equation, set of ordinary differential equations. Um, and you can see that the top one there is for membrane voltage, so change in membrane voltage over time. 
Uh, and the, the other two are for the activation and inactivation of sodium and potassium channels. The top one looks complicated. Um, it's really not that complicated. It's the capacitor equation, just differentiated in time. So the charge is the capacitance times the voltage. Differentiate that change in charge over time is the current. Um, and then decomposing the current into those uh, different components of the current. So the capacitive, to capacitive and the ionic current across the membrane. So how do you implement the hodgkin Huxley model? It's like everything else that anyone has talked about today. It's in MATLAB. Um, there's a, you can do it in Simulink. There's this uh, Simulink wiring diagram on the top left. Um, you can also go to just MATLAB Central, type in MATLAB Hodgkin Huxley. You'll get a bunch of different people that already have um, packages and Hodgkin Huxley functions. And so really what it models is, so it's four dimensional. One of them is for the membrane voltage. So what, this is an example output from um, Hodgkin Huxley model. And you can maybe see on the bottom there's a green trace. Um, and the blue trace is the membrane voltage over time. And so as the green trace is, uh, so the green trace is the input current into the cell. Um, as the input is stepped up, um, the output of the model, which is, uh, you know, simulating this membrane voltage, um, firing rate increases, generates action potentials. So it's the, for a really simple model, really captures a lot about what an action potential is, the characteristics of an action potential. So you have the depolarization, uh, hyperpolarization. Um, yeah. So the assumptions of the Hodgkin-Huxley model, um, membrane current can be divided into capacitive and ionic. And so you use a Hodgkin-Huxley model if you care about the shape of the action potential, so the ion channel dynamics. Um, you know, how, what are the channel densities? Is there more sodium channels than potassium channels? Uh, so your focus is on how a single neuron fires in action potential. But so our question was really, how do electric fields play around with synchrony in a population of neurons? So we probably want, you know, we're looking at synchrony. We want to be able to model a bunch of neurons together. Um, and we also want electric you know, how do the electric fields play in? So we probably want something that is distributed in space so we can get the electric fields playing around with the, you know, the dendritic arbor versus the soma. So this is probably not the appropriate model for us to use. So we thought, if we want something that's distributed in space, um, instead of, a, you know, a point neuron model that's just taking a tiny little patch of membrane, what about if we use uh, something like a multi-compartment Hodgkin-Huxley model? So what a multi-compartment Hodgkin-Huxley model is, is taking this little unit of uh, Hodgkin-Huxley dynamics and stringing them together. So we now have two Hodgkin-Huxley compartments. We've uh, hooked them together with some long longitudinal resistance. So there's two of them can increase the number, um, and we can start to keep building these compartments up until we get something that looks like a geometrically realistic neuron that's distributed in space. So maybe those compartments, the Hodgkin-Huxley compartments, are the axon of this pyramidal cell. And so how do you, so, okay, so this is good. So we have something that's distributed in space. Maybe we can think about, you know, how spatial electric fields are playing around with it. And so how do you implement it? Um, well, there's a really great uh, simulation environment package, which is all caps, neuron. Um, so, and so that's what we use. And it's really, uh, it's pretty cool. The stuff that it can do is, for a free package, it's really amazing. Um, so this is, on the top left, is... Uh, multi-compartment Hodgkin-Huxley model that I don't know, I don't know how they do it. Someone has scanned in a pyramidal neuron 
it's geometrically realistic, so all the compartments are a point in space. Um, so there's 176 compartments in this. Each compartment is, um, um, you know, multiple variables, around a dozen parameters or more. So this thing is, you know, hugely complex. It's hundreds of variables, thousands of parameters. Um, but the behavior that comes out of it is really incredibly realistic. So this is output from our pyramidal cell implemented in neuron. Um, this is the intracellular voltage uh, across all 176 compartments and color coded by just where the peak of the um, peak of the intracellular voltage is. So you can see this is, you know, really get complex behaviors from a neuron out of this. So you can see, for example, that on these bottom plots, you can note that the action potential actually is initiated in the axon, flows to the soma, and then to the dendrites. So it's the backward propagation that we normally think about um, so this, the, the neuron package is really able to capture just really complex dynamics. Uh, and I think you go to, I think it's neuron.yale. I should have a little place that you go. You can just go and download this package. I think there's a summer school that you need to sign up for in a few weeks. It's really, it takes a while to get into it. Uh, but the stuff that you can do is pretty cool. So, okay, so, right, okay, so we have something that's sort of distributed in space. But we want to look at networks, you know, network modeling. We want to look at synchrony among a population of neurons. So if we wanted to hook a bunch of these guys together in neuron, it's probably going to take a lot of computing. Um, chances of making a bug are pretty high. We'll go up with the complexity of the model. And also kind of the ability to, you know, intellectually surround our model really goes down with how complex it is. You know, really understand intuitively what's going on um, when we start having, you know, thousands and thousands of variables. So instead what we did, we jumped to the other end of the spectrum. So that was the crazy complicated neuron model. Um, and then for the network, we're going to use a really stupid, simple neuron model. I don't mean stupid in that it's not worthwhile, uh, you know, you can't get something interesting out of it or the people that use it are stupid. It just means stupid, stupid in that it's really simple. It's the simplest model of a neuron, definitely, that I've, I've ever seen. So really, it's treating a neuron as a single variable phi. Um, so just that the neuron is the single phase that advances, um, so that the time rate of change of this phase is just some number omega advances in time. So phi of t1 to phi of t2. And at least at this point, that's all this neuron, this model neuron does, is just starts at a phase of zero at the top, goes all the way around, phase of one. Um, and we say that when it hits one, it fires an action potential. So that's the pseudo action potential for a model. So this is just a model of a spontaneously spiking neuron. It's not doing anything interesting now. It's just spiking once every one over omega. So this is the trace of what this phase of this neuron is doing. Um, these are the events that we describe as action potentials. And the interspike interval is 1 over omega. So uh, we can add in multiple oscillators. Uh, so now there's two, uh, each with their own interspike interval. Um, so this really, you know, this is still pretty far away from something that looks like a neuroscience model. Um, we get a little bit closer when we add a bunch of these. So now instead of two oscillators, we have a hundred. Um, and so this is, looks sort of like a raster plot. Now we're getting something that sort of looks like an analogy for neuroscience. You know, ah, oh, that looks like a raster plot. I've seen that before. Uh, so this is the unit number on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and each tick is just one of those um, little uh, pseudo action potentials when the oscillator is reset from one, one to zero. 
and so, but there's still nothing really interesting in what's going on in this, these dynamics. We can totally di describe this um, just by knowing the, the frequency of each oscillator. Each spike is just happening at one over omega uh, from the next one. Nothing interesting going on. So really where the phase oscillator model starts to become a useful description of neuroscience problems is when you start to couple the oscillators. So when the oscillators are coupled, um, now the time rate of change of the phase, so describing totally one, one of our models, this phase phi i, it doesn't just advance by omega, but it's now affected by what each of the other neurons are doing. So there's this extra term f um, going from uh, 1 to n, where n is, in this case, is the 100 oscillators that we have. And so this is trying to model um, every time one of the other 100 oscillators fires, it gives this little pulse um, to this oscillator i. And so that's this pulse is this function f down here. And so what this is trying to represent is an EPSP. So every time neuron J fires, it gives this little pulse um, that's like a little synaptic potential, synaptic input into our oscillator I. And so you can see that on the right, there's the gray trace here. So the, the gray phi, it hits one and resets. And when it does so, it gives a little wiggle to the other phi's. So depending on how you define f, um, it can push them closer to the threshold. If it's, you know, if you're trying to model an excitatory EPSP, it can push them away if it's inhibitory. Um, and you can play around with the strengths and the shapes of f. Uh, and so depending on how you describe f, what the cu coupling is between these oscillators, you can start to get really interesting behaviors out of this system. So this is a totally synchronous system. I'll just contrast that with this when there's no coupling, um, no interesting behavior, just kind of, you know, looks like totally predictable spike times. Then when you throw in some coupling, the system is synchronized. Okay, so that's great. Good. So our problem was we wanted to, you know, look at synchrony in a population. We have a network of neurons. We can define each of these as a position in space. Um, and we've, be, with our treatment of the model, we've achieved conditions where it's synchronous and asynchronous. So, okay, so that's great. Now what we want is a measure of, uh, to define the synchrony. You know, so we want to be able to define some statistic where the, the network on the left, you know, we'll say it's 98% synchronous. The one on the right is 4% synchronous. So how do we define that measure of synchrony? This is actually really great. This is pretty much exactly what Noor and Fred talked about with that resultant vector. Um, so we can just take each of our phases. Um, so this is a snapshot of the system. Uh, on the left, when it's synchronous, all the phases are are bunched together, and when it's asynchronous on the right, where all the phases are kind of equally randomly distributed. And so we can see really intuitively that if we just added up all the phases in the synchronous case, um, that they would uh, constructively combine. So there's some, you know, there's some variance in the X component. Uh, that looks like it'll probably cancel out. Uh, but all of, if these are vectors, all of the Ys are pointing down, they're just gonna add up we're going to get some vector that's pointing strong, strongly down. Um, whereas in the asynchronous case, the x is positive x, negative x, it's going to cancel out. Positive y, negative y, it's going to cancel out. So we can define our synchrony statistic z um, exactly like that. So it's the length of a vector, a two-dimensional vector, um, where the x component is just the sum of all of the x components of all the phi's. Uh, and so in this case, they're on a unit circle, so the x component is just the cosine of phi i, the y component is just the sine. Um, so this is z in the top right, um, is the length of that two-dimensional vector. We normalize it by n, so it's always between zero and one. 
Um, and this is exactly the same uh, output. We can express it. This is usually the formalized version is the um, complex number notation. But it's, it comes out to exactly the same thing. So great. So this is, OK, great. So we have a model, easy to understand. It's a network model. We get synchrony out of it. You can start to play around with it. Uh, we have this statistic that we can use. Uh, right. Oh, yeah. So and so, okay. So we see that the st synchrony statistic Z does a good job of describing the system. So this is on the bottom. We have our pseudo raster plot. Um, you can see that on the left, the system is starting out really synchronous and kind of relaxes into asynchrony to the right. Um, and our population statistic Z at the top is really doing a good job of describing that. So it's starting off at one. So one Z equals one is synchronous, and it's kind of relaxing towards um, Z is around zero. So, but, so this is a population statistic. It's kind of describing the whole network. You can see that there's still structure in there, right? So you know, it looks like here there's maybe something going on. Is that a cluster that's still firing together? Um, and maybe down there, you know, you can see, sort of see little pairs that, that stick together. Um, so this statistic said doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't get at the structure of the network, uh, which is exactly what Leonard's going to talk about next.